everyone. My name is Benjamin, and welcome back to a discussion on the 2022 Senate elections. And we're going to start right off the bat with Oklahoma, which is, let's be 100% honest, it's safe Republican. Um, you've got James Lankford, who is almost certainly going to win the primary, and I really genuinely don't see a way he's going to lose it simply because he's got the endorsement of the other senator from Oklahoma and I don't really see um, I don't see any strong challengers from what I understand and in a Republican favorable environment uh, it's going to be very hard for the Democrats to even get within 20% in Oklahoma. And that's being generous to the Democrats in a good year. Um, and the truth is, I, Wikipedia isn't even last uh, listing any potential uh, challengers for the Democrats. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think Bice might attempt a run because... Well, she was a representative for one term, but she won kind of in a fluky election. And I said it was a fluke at the time, and I said it was a fluke leading up to 2020 when people were insisting, no, 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 she's going to win re-election. She's going to win re-election. I said, no, she's not. Her win in 2018 was a fluke. And I said the same thing about uh, Utah's 4th Congressional District regarding Ben McAdams unseating Mia Love. I said... Yeah, Burgess Owens is going to win that. I was really more confident than I should have been in that one. Um, I'll be 100% honest. That was one of the closer house races out there. Not as close as Iowa's second congressional district, but we don't have to get into that. But, yeah, I admit, I was I was a little bit... Um, I, I was more confident than I should have been in Utah's fourth, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, but I was still right that McAdams win was a bit fluky. Anyway, moving on to Oregon, this is for Ron Wyden's seat. And I'm going to be 100% honest, uh, I don't think he has the name recognition even in Oregon as his, um, as his hilariously junior uh, partner. Um, Jeff Markey, or Murky, or however you say it. Um, so this could be theoretically a more competitive race than meets the eye. However, I'm skeptical that it's a flippable seat for Republicans. In the absolute perfect environment, uh, I could I could see it being competitive. Like I said, in a perfect environment, I could see it. But I don't think it's going to be a perfect environment. Though, to be fair, this was the most recent Oregon Senate seat to have a Republican in office. It was... Or was it the other one? I think it was this one. No, it was Marky. It was Marky's seat. Um, and that one almost was Republican in 2008 when their incumbent Republican lost. And he only narrowly lost. And I suspect a lot of that had to do with the fact there was a... Uh, challenger from the right in that election. In the Constitution Party, and their candidate got 50-some-odd percent, uh, not 50 percent, Jesus, uh, got 5 percent of the vote. And the gap between the Republican and uh, Markey was like 3 percent or even slightly less than that. So, that could have flipped. And it was actually a potentially competitive race. In, that one was a potentially competitive race in 2014. 
until the Republicans can uh, campaign uh, self imploded. It went and committed self died. Um, this is going to be a little bit different. Um, I think that whoever is the Republican candidate, which is possibly probably going to be Joe Ray Perkins. Uh, who is the chairwoman for the Lynn County Republican Party and the Oregon nominee last time around in 2020, she's probably going to be the nominee this time around. She could crack 40%. I'll be 100% honest, but I don't really see much more than that. Um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Oregon is also going to be very interesting this cycle just because they're gaining a congressional district. And the state and the Democrats in the state legislature there have agreed to power share for redistricting, meaning we're going to see a reasonably fair map for Oregon. Um, We'll see how enthusiastic Republicans are in Oregon, but I'm going to be honest with you. It's going to be hard to rate this as anything. You know, my confidence is pretty high. I don't really see Oregon flipping. Uh, things could change, obviously, if I see some polling uh, that indicates otherwise. But, uh, yeah, it, I, I find it very hard in a state that's trending towards the Democrats that the Republicans could flip a seat. Um, and the last race we're going to look at is in Pennsylvania. And this is the seat Pat Toomey is leaving open. Um, I think if Toomey was going to run for re-election, it'd, I'd be decently confident that he'd win re-election. But we'll see exactly what happens. On the Republican side, you've got a few people who have... Um, run for various elections before. But no one really gather, you know, no one whom I would consider truly significant. Um, the 2018 nominee for Lieutenant Governor Jeff Bardos is probably the most significant, but he obviously lost that statewide election. Um, and one person I'm actually surprised is not even listed as a potential candidate is somebody who I think really actually could win the state and maybe even win the caller counties for the Republicans. That's a uh, representative from Pennsylvania 1st Congressional District, Brian Fitzpatrick. Uh, he is a very moderate Republican. He's kind of to the Republicans what Joe Manchin is to the Democrats. Um, he's very moderate, and that would play extremely well in the Collar Counties. It would perform well in the Pittsburgh suburbs, and it would perform well in Erie. Um, I think he's a very good candidate to win statewide. Uh, simply because of that, he'd be able to not lose tremendously poorly in the rural areas. But the list, at least from where I stand, is kind of... Eh. I'm just, I'm not really impressed to be 100% honest. But we'll see how that uh, shapes out. On the Democratic side, on the other hand, you have a lot of people who are, um, who have declared but the one who seems to, from my understanding, be getting the most attention is John Fetterman, at least in the circles that I uh, am talking about or you know talk within or am involved in. 
he's the one who gets who is getting the most attention, and he's the current lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania, uh, and he's a mayor from coal country, and he's the type of person who thinks he could get the white working class to continue to vote Democratic. Though there are some issues with him, if you don't know what I mean, uh, just type in John Fetterman uh, gunpoint and do a Google search of that. Um, Basically, he held someone at gunpoint and it just doesn't look good. Like, he makes it to the general election, Republicans are going to drum that up and I think it's a slam dunk win for the Republicans. Because it's going to basically say, oh, you think we're a certain type of person. Look at what the Democrat did. You know, and the whole, you know, accuse the Democrats are playing the whole accuse your enemy of that which you are guilty uh, game. <clears throat> Connor Lamb is another Democrat who is, well, being hyped up. I could, I'm going to be 100% honest. I think he's the one who would be the least controversial and one of the better candidates that could potentially be nominated. Simply because he is not nearly as radical as, say, a lot of the candidates I'm looking at. Um... You know, Philadelphia City Council, Mayor of Philadelphia. I mean, this is... It's kind of almost a wish list for progressives looking at most of the Democrats on this list. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical um, that this is going to be... I'm kind of skeptical. And let's not forget, this is a Republican favorable year. So as long as the Republicans don't nominate a complete lunatic and are able to mount a reasonable campaign, it's absolutely a winnable seat for them. That said, it's a winnable seat for the Democrats because... (coughs) Sorry about that. Uh, Because at the end of the day, the Democrats... It's an open seat, and open seats are much harder to hold, even in favorable national environments. And given what we've seen in special elections so far, I'm still calculating the exact statistics on it, but the Republicans are doing very well in those, from what I understand and from what I've seen. Um, So it's probably going to be a Republican favorable environment. Um, declined candidates include the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf, uh, mayor of Pittsburgh, and uh, the AG of Pennsylvania. If we move down and look at a few other areas, uh, I, I agree with all the major handicappers in rating this as a toss-up or a battleground. I don't think that's an unfair characterization of this race, and I think it's absolutely the right decision. So that's where we stand. Um, Forget exactly how many seats would be Republican at this point, but so far, four competitive races. I do have the Republicans flipping a seat, but again, that's because of Chris Sununu, and He's indicated he's very interested in running for that seat, so he's not even potential. He's publicly expressed interest in running, indicating that he is maybe leaning that direction. And given what, I, what I've heard about Chris Sununu, he has national ambition, so being a senator would help raise him to the spotlight, especially if he can get good sound bites. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. I hope you all enjoyed. See you next time. Take it easy. Have a very lovely evening. Remember, a like, a comment, and a subscription would be greatly appreciated. And, um, again, I want to thank everybody for pushing me over 800. And let's see if we can hit 1,000 by the end of the year. That would be fantastic, and I love it. Um, But it requires you all to help me. 
you know, sharing these these videos and commenting helps the algorithm not hate me. Hey, have a very lovely evening. Good night, y'all.